Yes, and the EYLF, and I guess I guess our knowledge and experience from um, before those two uh, documents acknowledge the importance of the physical environment as a contributor, a main contributor to babies and toddlers learning. Um, you would have you would have just, you and your colleagues would have just recently completed a quality improvement plan as, as part of the national quality standard. Um, were there any, any areas that you identified that relate to the physical environment and babies and toddlers sense of agency that you particularly thought were important and you wanted to focus on? Yeah, one of the um, elements that we identified was 3.1.3, which talked about environments as responsive to children's needs and abilities. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we identified that the environment was a huge contributor to a child's agency, providing the opportunities for, to practice skills and to provide the unhurried time, not just the space and the resources that babies and toddlers need. Um, so we talked about providing an environment that was open and responsive to, to children, to all children, um, and rather than adults. So we looked in at what was in our room as adult pleasers, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, like so what? having mm -hmm. strings of painting hang, paintings hanging up, you know, very high where the babies can't even see them. Who is that there for? So I suppose we just started to question our practice as far as the environments that we were providing I was just thinking that to provide a responsive environment for a group of children up to 18 months, it means that it would have to be uh, changing a lot because they're learning so so quickly. Um, so much and happening changing. In yeah, that, yeah, that in you'd that have to be really time. tuned in to yeah. what what are they up to now and what are they interested in. Yeah, absolutely. And so then there's that fine line between um, providing a predictable environment and providing consistency, mm. but also providing small changes to um, engage children's curiosity and their interest and to encourage them to continue to explore as well. So not coming in every Friday to change the room around completely, but responding to children's changing needs and abilities and making small changes mm -hmm. like new, new resources, um, like more complex, smaller blocks, um, perhaps changing the chairs over from the high chairs to a chair that a child can get themselves into. I mean, I guess that's a, that's a real plug too for having open-ended materials, isn't it, that can be used in a variety of ways that um, by that whole age range of birth to 18 months, so that, so that you can stack them, you can hold them, you can bang them together, you can put them in containers, you can dump them out, those, those kinds Absolutely. of materials that cater for a wide range of, of interests and abilities. Yeah, yeah. and not, not just for um, their, their interests and, and abilities, yeah, for their interests, it, it keeps them engaged because there's not one way to use a pine cone. Yeah. So not, not the same way that there's one way to use a, a single piece puzzle. Once you've mastered it, yeah. you potentially swipe it off the table because yeah. you're done with it. A pine cone, you'll see. <laughs> in our service, they're in the baby's room and they're in the four-year-old kinder as well. So were there any other parts of the NQS that you particularly paid attention to in relation to babies and toddlers and your quality improvement plan? Yeah, also in standard three, we looked at 3.2.1 and 3.2.2, .2, uh, which looks at spaces and resources that are well organised and easy to navigate. And so again, it was that fine line between providing well-sorted, um, easy to navigate spaces, but without following it around after the children, picking up after them and um, interrupting, I suppose, their exploration. So that fine line between That's a tricky one, isn't it? And, yeah. yeah. Because you, you, you'd be very suspicious if you went into a baby or toddler room that was extremely neat and tidy and organised, because yeah, you'd think, absolutely. I don't know, the children aren't playing. Yeah. But if it gets, I remember Jim Greenman describing um, the floor space in some babies and toddlers rooms as being like a minefield that you know just strewn with all sorts of junk and that's no good either. No. Yeah. What, what about 
the ways you display um, and organise play materials for children, for, for babies and toddlers? I think it's important for um, materials to be well sorted, um, for there to be multiples, um, easy to, to find and easy to, um, to access um, and, and usable in good working order. Mm. Um, when I'm trying to encourage my co-educators to think about environments that have appeal to them and that are productive for them. Um, I knew, used the analogy of a kitchen. If you walked into a messy kitchen that had just a blunt knife and a, a burnt out saucepan, is that inviting you to cook? Do you want to be productive in that environment or do you just want to walk away from it? So are you a, a, a fan or an advocate of um, you know, baskets and bins of toys or, or, or not? Or not? I think in well-grouped, well-presented baskets, I think that that's a really attractive way to invite children into play. Um, I think big tubs of, um, of everything can be overwhelming and um, encounters that being able to make a choice, too many choices. It's a great invitation to toss things Dump out. It and all. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, which is a fine activity but not not always what you what you want them to spend You're hoping, all, yeah. all their time doing. So yeah. Yeah. So I remember a, a training video that I used to use a long, long time ago and they asked the question in an, in an infant toddler environment, said it was a worthwhile question to ask, if you took away all the toys what is there in this environment to learn from? And I've always thought that was a really valuable question. In other words, what kind of learning is built into the furniture, into the equipment, into the way the space is, is arranged? And some infant toddler rooms, if you took away all the toys, there's nothing much there except a few shelves and a couple of baskets. Some infant toddler rooms, you take away all the toys and there's still tons of stuff to, to learn from. So I think it's a worthwhile question for people to, people to think about. Yeah, I've seen babies and toddler rooms that look like they've done that exact thing because having toys out, they just they just throw them on the ground. Mm -hmm. So they take them away. So that's interesting yeah. to say that. I think without meaning to, I have seen educators um, practice that experiment. Yeah. yeah. The idea of a rich environment, I think, is particularly important for babies and toddlers because um, they because they need, and this may sound contradictory, because they need those quality one-to-one -one interactions with educators so much. And if, if, if you go into one of those fairly barren infant toddler rooms where there's just a few toys and nothing much, then the, then the educators are the main attraction. Are the resources. And yeah. um, therefore you need higher ratios. And one of the, the, the kind of complementary idea to that is that you, if you have a really rich learning environment where babies and toddlers can engage on their own, that frees the adults up to have those quality interactions because they're not sort of running the show. They're not having to, to drive the engagement or the learning or that sense of agency. It's, it's, yeah. happening, it's happening on its own and they can, they can join in to, yeah. um, to, to add quality to it. They can observe it and they can support it, yeah, rather than entertaining, I yeah. suppose, yeah. Yeah, a group of children. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good sign of a, um, of a rich and productive environment is when you see the educators uh, not being followed around and traipsed after for mm -hmm. entertainment, I guess. They, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're free to, um, to observe and like we said before, look at, um, use children's cues to decide what support is necessary. Mm. Okay, so, so let's go back to agency again. We never really, never really left it, but, but what do you think gets in the way of encouraging that sense of agency, um, gets in the way of educators encouraging that, encouraging that sense of agency in babies and toddlers? Unfortunately, I think the most common thing in a babies and toddlers room is the, it's the clock and it's <laughs> all the things that we feel like we need to get through in a day. Um, and they're important things. Children need to eat, they need to sleep, they need their nappy changed. They are things that have to happen during the day, but I think that we can approach these routine times um, in less of a rush mm -hmm. and with a bit more flexibility. Including the children in the routines is a really beautiful example of how we're getting, getting through 
the same things but we're still being attentive and we're being responsive. We're addressing that, that need to support children's mm -hmm. agency. So slow down and slow down and don't be a slave to the clock. I think absolutely like and it's easier saying. said than done but um, I said before being five minutes early through your lunch routine who is who's really benefiting mm. from that if we're really thinking about why we why are we here who are we here for I think that um, the children get will get so much more from a messy lunch routine that ran 10 minutes late mm -hmm. than a a clean, very well organised, five minute early lunch routine. It's interesting, I, I heard just last week um, an educator in an infant toddler room who, who very proudly said that they had all the babies eat at the same time and all the babies went down, they had to work hard but they got all the babies to sleep at the same time and they pretty much got up at the same time I think and, and um, she said it, that works really well because otherwise, uh, otherwise the educators would be too stressed. And I, I couldn't resist saying to her, oh really, what I've heard from most educators is the opposite, that there's less stress I if you individualise. I could more stressful mm. than having 16 babies all wake up at the same time. Yeah. Um, not just stressful for me, stressful for the children who yeah. are left waiting because yeah. you can't attend to that many children yeah. at the same time. Um, and it really takes away from those moments to engage one-on-one -on -one with children when, you, when you're when you aware that you've got four or five other children who are waiting for mm -hmm. your spoon in their mouth or for you to get them out of their cot. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really important concept that we were talking before about routines and using routines as part of the curriculum rather than time away from the curriculum. And if you pair that with the notion that the relationships and interactions are absolutely critical. Um, one of the quality areas in the national quality standard and, and a key concept throughout the, yeah. the EYLF, then um, that's all the more reason to slow down and see those times as the opportunities, as opportunities. to have those one-to-one -one interactions. Because yeah. you might, you, you can't, it doesn't make sense to set aside a time for those. It's do them no, in the context yeah. of, of daily life and in, um, in infant toddler care. Yeah. yeah, and because it is a busy day in any children's service room, but in a babies and toddlers room, it is a busy day. So yeah, you're right. It's important to seize those moments throughout the day because if you do, if you're choosing to put time aside for them, more more often than not, you're not going to get those times. Yeah, <laughs> the end of the day is going to come and they, they won't Last have Last on happened. the list, it's going to miss out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so slowing down, um, using routines, I guess that's about, that's about that holistic view of the curriculum, Recognize, thinking yeah. of the curriculum as, as everything, as everything every, yeah. every opportunity. Anything else? Rich environment, we've talked about talked about that, um, building learning into the environment to, to free adults up? I think um, s stopping to remind ourselves why and, and who we're here for, reaffirming what our image of the child is and does this include babies and toddlers and mm -hmm. if not why not, I think reminding ourselves all of the time why we're here and who we're here for. I mean the very fact that the decision was made to have one framework for babies and toddlers and children over three yeah. in itself is a strong statement that that we should have that same image of them as capable and confident learners and teachers of other people and contributors to to their own experience so um, i think it's a matter of educators working hard to translate that into their into their daily practices. Practice, yeah. So um, just to, to kind of, I guess, to, to sum up, um, what do you think helps educators appreciate the importance of agency and, and encourages them to support it in young children? Um, thinking about your role as a, as a lecturer and as a, a pedagogical leader in, in your centre, what do you think helps educators to become more conscious of that and do a better job of supporting agency. I think seeing other people's passion for it is a really sends a really strong message. Um, so creating that work environment where there are passionate, engaged people who um, who are role modelling and pointing out these this subtle learning 
um, for everybody and celebrating it every day for everyone to see. I think that can be really contagious. Mm -hmm. So you're saying if, if one or a few people are excited, they can get other Pass people excited. It on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think um, the way that a babies and toddler room is staffed um, can really set that that scene and set that feeling of mm -hmm. how the entire room's going to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that relates back to the more you the more you know, the more you see the more that you, you see, need yeah. you need people who who know a bit about what to look for no agency and no learning when they see it, even in very young children, and can share that enthusiasm for it with, Absolutely. Um, with others. Yeah. So, so if you were giving advice, and you're probably in a position where you, where you actually have to do this, it, um, people who want to make working with babies and toddlers more interesting and exciting, and who, who want to support that sense of agency in very young children, what are, what are some of the things that you would suggest to them? I think standing back and allowing babies and toddlers to attempt and to persist. And I think once you see what they're capable of, it's, it's surprising and it's really rewarding and it, it makes all the, the, the other things um, worth it, I suppose. When you see, it makes the learning more visible mm -hmm. when you haven't just swooped in and done for these done for babies and toddlers what they can potentially do for mm. themselves. When, when you're saying that I'm thinking about giving them space literally that is that there needs there needs to be enough space so there's not that cl uh, clumping and bunching and climbing all over each other and being on top of each other when they don't want to be. Um, there's that but there's also something about I don't know giving them headspace and giving them yeah. giving them opportunities to to try it to attempt it to see if they can if they can achieve something but it's tuned in it's tuned in leaving on the along isn't it, it isn't because just going off in a corner and no, talking to your because colleagues you're observing yeah yeah any so anything else that, any other advice um, i think that also encourage that feeling of being capable um, in babies and toddlers when they they also observe and they notice that you're not swooping in to, to do everything for them, that you've, you've let them persist. Mm. So, that, so that in itself is a message of, of uh, I trust you, I, Absolutely. I uh, have confidence that, you. That, that, that you can do it. Yeah. yeah. And there's also uh, in good either family daycare or centre-based programs for babies and settings for babies and toddlers, one of the things that I notice is that um, even if they're slightly larger groups than are ideal or not quite the ideal ratios, in the really good programs, there's a, there's a sense of peace and calm at times, a kind of, and, and I guess that's another kind of space. It's a yeah. sort of um, emotional space that you can be yourself and there's just time to be still or time to go off and be on your own safely. Um, Time, time to reflect. We don't yeah. think of babies and toddlers as critical reflection, but critically reflecting. But I guess they they do reflect sometimes. Just that that sense of being. Yeah, the energy that adults bring into the room is absolutely felt by everybody, especially by the the babies and the toddlers in the room. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, you're right. It does. You can feel it as soon as you walk in. Mm. So it's not that. I mean, back in I remember in in the old days there was this notion of infant stimulation and kind of the more the better and so occasionally even now you see educators or hear educators who just non-stop talking and they're, they're, they're doing that entertaining that you yeah. spoke about before but it's as though they think the more input they have the more the babies are going to learn and the babies and toddlers and it really is about that, that dance between initiating and responding and standing back and engaging isn't it? And letting children absorb and reflect, like you said, and have time to yeah to, to be alone with those ideas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess in a sense, what it boils down to is that obviously it's important to encourage babies and toddlers' sense of agency for their own learning, but in recognizing it when it happens and appreciating the role that educators can play, that it 
makes educators work with babies and toddlers more rewarding, rewarding. for themselves as well. Yeah. So it's, a, it's kind of a, an upward spiral. It's better for the children, it's better for the educators, and so it goes. Yeah, and, and so it goes. And I mean, we haven't, we haven't really mentioned families here, but I think um, maybe that goes without saying that, that when educators are enthusiastic and when they have that partnership with families, they, they convey that excitement about babies and, and there's, there's that sort of sharing that's happening and, um, and, and, and families are keen to learn more about their child, they're keen to share with yeah. educators what they know about what their child. What they know about the child, yeah. Mm. So we'll, we'll finish by showing you some more vignettes of uh, babies and toddlers uh, enacting that sense of agency, sometimes on their own and sometimes in interactions with educators. Of course, educators play a number of different and really important roles in babies' learning, but sometimes supporting babies' sense of agency is, is just staying in the background, just being there and leaving them alone to do what they're doing. Being watchful, of course, but allowing them to meet challenges and, and make choices. Giving them space and time to do it themselves applies even to things like eating and sleeping. In the last segment, the baby has a preferred way of going to sleep that involves a long time happily being in her cot, observing what's going on around her before she settles down and goes to sleep. <laughs> 